confusing and perhaps overwhelming times, what should we all be doing? Once again, we'd like to address some of the issues that are concerning you. Today, I'm joined by Dr Rohin Francis, who's been giving advice about the virus and the reaction to it in a series of videos online. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's start with supermarkets then. Um, what they're calling these elderly hours, is that safe? Because presumably, if you are vulnerable in any way, if you are over 70 or with a health condition, you can't guarantee who you're going to come into contact with and what you might touch in a supermarket. I think that's right. I mean, a lot of the approach to the response to coronavirus is going to be looking for the, the, the least worst scenario. And I think um, it's impossible to completely eliminate risk for the elderly and those with health conditions. But I think this is a step in the right direction. I, I braved a supermarket the other day and just turned around and left because it really was uh, completely hectic inside. And I think if there can be an allocated time uh, for, for the elderly to attend the supermarket, it would at least minimize the chance. And I think all the, the measures we're trying to take are directed at trying to, to minimize risk to those vulnerable groups. There's a real balance right now between uh, causing anxiety and panic and also people understanding the severity of the situation we're in now, right now. What would you say to those people who are currently ignoring government advice? Um, we've seen people going to busy pubs, going mm -hmm. to pubs in general. We've seen people booking to go to have a meal on Mother's Day with their family. What should they be doing? I think it's, it's, it's difficult and... Um, I, I fully understand um, why people might think like that because the, the, the threat doesn't necessarily seem quite real at the moment. But that is the nature of, of an exponential growth of something like a virus. And um, everything that's, that's done before a pandemic will look like an overreaction, but everything that's done afterwards will look like we, we weren't prepared. And I think that the polarization you kind of refer to there about how there are two reactions to, to the virus, one of denial or just thinking it is an overreaction, and one of uh, complete panic or hysteria, I think that the common thing between those two is they result in a, a lack of action because one is paralyzed by fear and the other one doesn't feel that there's, there's any need to take action. So what I'd like to try and suggest is that there's actually a middle path and, and without downplaying the, the gravity of the situation, we are facing a very uh, major challenge. It will affect all of our lives for, for quite a while perhaps. Um, but it's one that we can address if, if we are positive and, and, and um, take proactive action. Uh, and I'm not saying that as a sort of uh, just a mindless optimist. Mm. I, I, I'm basing that on, on the scientific evidence because there are many reasons that we can approach this with an optimistic mindset. And the, the more that we do now, uh, sooner rather than later, the, the better the outcome will be. OK, um, I just want to show our viewers a video. Uh, it's a clip that's gone viral from uh, the comedy, the medical drama Scrubs. It kind of um, illustrates the, the hidden enemy we're dealing with, really, in terms of how easily any germs, but obviously in this situation we're talking about um, the COVID-19 virus, how it can be passed on so easily. We're really dealing with something that um, I've read if you pretend that you've got COVID-19, if you think that you, if you can say to yourself, I've got this infection, it will determine how you act around other people. So you will take seriously washing your hands for 20 seconds. You will take seriously social distancing, keeping two metres apart and cleaning the surfaces that you touch, cleaning the glasses that you put down on the surface and putting on. Is this the right type of approach now? Because we don't know who's got it. The testing has stopped unless you are in hospital at the moment. I think that's that's a, a good approach. Um, it's not one that I, I've, I've heard before, but I think it uh, would certainly encourage a lot of the behaviour that we, we, we all need to take. I think... It's important to emphasize that even individual measures can be, can, uh, be amplified to have a, a huge effect. Um, if I were to, to donate 10 pounds to a charity fundraiser, that will remain 10 pounds. But if I make a small change to my behavior, in a few weeks time, that could, that could translate to something very large. So for example, at the moment, if I were to contract the virus today and infect two to three people, by simplifying the math slightly, by the end of a, the month, we'd expect two to 700 people to be infected starting from me. But if I can reduce that to just one person, so we're just saying, uh, changing my behavior with social um, distancing to reduce that from two or three people to one, then at the end of the month, there'd just be four additional people affected. So it's a huge difference.
So what would you say to a pick an age, any, any age, a 23 year old who says, it's not gonna affect me badly, I'm gonna get mild symptoms if I get it at all, I don't need to change my behavior. Or to somebody who's over 70 <coughs> who says, I'm fit and healthy, I want to go and play golf, I want to go and go to the pub, what would your advice be to them right now? Um, I think we've, we've heard a lot of uh, people say, uh, and I'm not sure how much, they, how insensitive it, it can sound, is that this really only affects old people, I'll, I'll be okay. Um, and I don't think that would sound particularly nice to, to one of those old people. Um, and I'd, I'd urge people that not just to consider themselves. We are trying to protect the, the vulnerable in society, but it, it's a misconception to think this doesn't affect young people entirely. We are hearing reports from Italy and China that young, fitter people are being affected. And secondly, if the hospitals are all full from older people being treated, then when a 32-year-old uh, lady with a, pre a complication post-pregnancy or a 25-year-old who has a road traffic accident is admitted, they might struggle to, to, to find the same care that they would mm. have otherwise. Um, a very straightforward question on the surface, but what I'm asking every doctor that I come across on television or in real life, what is a continuous cough. There's lots of confusion because as soon as you have one, that's it, you're in isolation and those that live with you are too. What is a continuous cough? A continuous cough, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I think there's some, some interpretation here which, which is not necessarily the most clear, so I, I do appreciate the confusion here, but a continuous cough is one where you are, are coughing frequently, uh, so several times in over, say, a 10-minute period, and, and uh, without much of a, a respite for a, for a two week period. So I think we've got to have a low threshold for uh, determining what symptoms are because okay. this, this can present in different ways. And the hypothetical you gave earlier about um, imagining that you have the virus isn't actually that far fetched because a lot of young people will have very mild symptoms and maybe entirely asymptomatic. So I think we have to have a low threshold for assuming if you have uh, um, symptoms suggestive, fever, cough, um, then we'd assume that uh, you are unwell and hence socially isolate. For those who aren't feeling at all optimistic, give us a 20 second message of how to empower those people. Sure, well, I think one we've covered is that each person can make a difference. It's not a case that, you know, uh, one person, if I don't do anything, it won't, won't happen. We can all make a difference. The statistics, I think we get a bit distracted with some of the numbers sometimes. They're actually better than, than we think. And um, scientists around the world are, are working around the clock on this. And I'm sure we will beat it if we all work together. Dr. Rowan Francis, thank you very much. All from us for now. Mary will be back with the latest, of course, at 6.30. Bye for now. Well, there remains plenty of confusion when it comes to coronavirus and lots of questions in an attempt to answer some of those and to break down some of the myths. Dr. Rogan Francis, a cardiologist in East London, has created a series of online videos to give people advice. I felt frankly overwhelmed by the deluge of information coming at us from every angle, and I'm sure you have too. I've seen real anxiety amongst some of my friends, so I thought I'd make a quick interim video to assuage at least some of those fears, I hope without ignoring any of the facts, nor burying our heads in the sand. Well, I'm very pleased to say that Dr. Rohan joins me now. Dr. Rohan, thank you for coming in to me. We'll talk about myth busting in just one second, but first of all, you're a key worker, you're a doctor here in London, you've got two kids. What's your reaction um, to the schools now closing, but staying open, provisions for key workers like yourself? Yes, um, I mean, obviously uh, uh, something we kind of expected, but mm -hmm. still uh, a bit of a surprise. My wife is, is not a key worker, she, she's a non-medic, mm -hmm. so it remains to be seen. We need a bit of clarity in terms of whether our kids will be still attending school or not. I know that um, uh, at the moment our school uh, said they're going to close. Yeah. So, um, yeah, big, big surprise. Yeah, OK, well, listen, let's get back to that myth busting now because it's important. Um, you put out these a, ser a series of videos, haven't you? And what's the biggest myth that you've been hearing throughout this kind of developing story, if you like? Well, there's, there's a, a wide range, but I think the most common and, and perhaps the most depressing is, is the allegation that this was a, a manufactured bioweapon and uh, there's, there's a big conspiracy behind it. But I think, you know, some of these conspiracy theories are, are kind of ridiculous, but even, even um, in, within the scientific community, I think people can be guilty of 
sharing unsubstantiated mm. rumors or, or things without sufficient evidence. So I just caution people to be mindful of stuff they're sharing with friends, with, with their relatives, because uh, it all contributes to a, to a, There's a just fear. There's so much out there, isn't there, with everything going online and everyone having an opinion. But you talked there in that clip about anxiety that people mm -hmm. are feeling. And it is because you can just look and just search and you hear so much. Where should people look, be looking for their information, the correct information? In the UK, we'd advise everybody to start with the NHS website, which um, has very clear resources on, on the kind of things we should be doing. The government itself also, I think, uh, has, a, has a very good website on the advice that we strongly advise everybody to follow. Yeah. Um, you know, we are talking potentially, nothing's been said at the moment, uh, that, that London may go into lockdown, we don't know. And there are people who are still, you get the sense, um, just want to carry on living their lives. What would you say to people out there who are kind of ignoring the advice, really, and just want to make plans this weekend? Sure. I think it's important to say this is not a, a moral judgment call. I understand that kind of sentiment because at the moment uh, the, num the numbers are low, but the, the nature of how this will grow, it will be very rapid, and before you know it, it will be too late. So please be proactive. Dr. Ryan, thank you so much for joining me this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Well, along with all this, it's been a pretty great day out there, hasn't it? Uh, what's uh, the rest of the week looking like? Here's Ross with the forecast. My daddy on the TV.